When we're shut inside Bailey's car, Lauren stops screaming and starts to whimper. I take her ice-cold hand in mine. You didn't get hurt, did you? She's fine, Bailey says, starting the engine and peeling away from Sparrow Hill. I wasn't talking to you, I say, irritated enough to raise my voice. That roof could have squashed you both. Jade glares at me. Brilliant idea, letting her come. What was I supposed to do? You shouldn't have decided we should go to that decrepit old barn in the first place. Lauren's whimpers give way to short, shallow breaths. She's hyperventilating. My stomach turns as Bailey swerves over to the side of the road and throws the car into park. Bailey twists around as far as her seat will let her. Hey, look at me, she says. She reaches back and gives Lauren's knee a shake. Her voice is gentle. You have to stop crying. If you go home hysterical, you're going to get us in trouble. Lauren wipes her face with the sleeve of her jacket. I know. I'm sorry. I just want to go home. Bailey sighs, turns forward, puts the car in drive, and pulls away from the shoulder. Lauren hiccups. I can't take her home like this, I say. She's too upset. Jade reclines her seat into my knees, props her feet up on the dash. She's okay. She just needs a minute. Right? Jade turns to Lauren for affirmation. My sister nods, but won't make eye contact. She has always found my friends ridiculously cool, especially Jade, with her oversized vintage sweaters and armfuls of bangles and impeccably drawn winged eyeliner. Jade smiles at Lauren. When she turns back around, Lauren lowers her head onto my lap, crying silently. This is just the culmination of her being stressed out. She's still upset about Emma's party, and now she's spooked from the roof collapse. And embarrassed about losing it in front of my friends. That's what I try to tell myself. But I can't tear my eyes away from Bailey's knuckles, wrapped around her steering wheel, white as the snow on the hill. I don't bother falling asleep once I'm back in my room because I have to be up for work at six. Milk and Sugar, Ashley's Cafe, opens at seven on the weekends. Ashley doesn't look at me funny when she comes to wake me up. Doesn't say anything about my midnight jaunt. Relief and guilt needle me as I help her chip the ice off the windshield of her SUV and let her prattle on about the storm that's supposed to hit us tomorrow morning. My nerves are still frazzled from last night, from not sleeping, which leaves me with little patience for the way Ashley and another car at the end of our road sit deadlocked at a stop sign because they can't agree who should go first. Because people around here are polite. Like the type of polite where if there's one piece of pie left at dessert, the person next to you will give a 20-minute dissertation on why you should have it. Just last week, Tom Cornwell an elderly man who always orders one poached egg over toast, slipped on ice outside milk and sugar. I've seen people in New York threaten to sue for less, but Tom actually apologized to Ashley and refused the free breakfast she tried to force on him. According to the radio, it's a record low of 5 degrees today, wind chill minus 25. I feel it in the joints of my fingers once we get to the cafe as I get the coffee pots going, in the ice cold of the toilet seat when I pee quickly before we open. The energy is off in the cafe when the regulars start straggling in. We're not as busy as we usually are on Saturdays, probably because of the weather. The people who do come in grumble over their coffee not being quite right, the heat not coming on fast enough as they wait for their breakfast. Even old Tom Cornwell is pissy. He must have developed an allergy to gluten in the past few days because he spends five minutes scolding me for bringing him regular toast. He stops just short of accusing me of trying to kill him and doesn't drop his change in the tip jar like he always does. Rob, the cook, screws up whatever orders I manage to get right. Maybe it's me. I'm exhausted. The energy I do have leeches out of me. By 10 a.m., I'm a puddle on the stool in the kitchen while I work on the plate of scrambled eggs Rob made me for breakfast. 
I can't eat without hearing the crack of the barn roof, without hearing Lauren's ear-splitting scream.